Shaw, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the Premier. We will support our agriculture, food processing, and retail businesses to help them continue to provide safe, accessible, and affordable food for all Albertans. In Alberta, this has always been relevant, but it is critically important now given the stresses of COVID-19. To be clear, Alberta's food supply is well established and it will maintain. Alberta's food production and distribution systems are diverse and stable. We are in constant contact with our partners in Alberta's food supply chain and Albertans can be confident that the necessary steps are being taken to make sure people have what they need. To ensure Alberta's food supply systems are maintained, we are taking the following actions. We are putting an official request through to the federal government to deem the entire food supply chain as an essential service to ensure a safe and stable food supply for Albertans. We are focused on maintaining a strong and open trade relationship between Canada and the U.S. for movement of essential goods across our border. We are working to maintain functional rail service and commercial trucking systems within Canada and North America to enable the movement of essential goods. Our government is also coordinating with federal agencies to ensure Indigenous peoples have equal opportunity for health and safety and not falling behind. And we are working with retailers on supply pressures for high demand items and monitoring availability in rural, remote and Indigenous communities. There are a lot of moving parts to get food to markets and on kitchen tables. Alberta's supply chain is responding well, but it is not business as usual. Restaurants have seen a significant change. More Albertans are working from home and not eating out as often. Albertans are making fewer trips to the grocery store, and some have unnecessarily been stockpiling or bulk buying out of fear of future shortages. Major retailers have shared that they are seeing a 50% increase in total sales and sales per customers have doubled. Demand for long shelf life products and fresh meat has significantly increased. And I want to clearly state and reiterate what Premier Kenny and Chief Medical Officer of Health Dr. Hinshaw have said to Albertans. Do not hoard food and daily essentials. The system is intact and people should be mindful of irrational panic buying and the effect it has on their neighbours. Alberta's food supply is and, continue, and will continue to be secure and we need to make sure everyone can access the essentials that they need. To ensure that keeps being the case, retailers are responding with a number of measures like item limits per customer, reduced business hours, seniors only early opening hours, increased pickup and delivery options, and increased hygiene and safety practices. Food banks here in Alberta have also seen a huge rise in request for support and they will expect this trend will continue. These charities have s helped support our most vulnerable populations. Unfortunately, as Albertans face great adversity, we have seen donations drop due to the economic impact of this current pandemic. Our government is working closely with food banks across the province to understand the requirements and assess their short, medium and long term needs to ensure they have necessary food supply. Demand is also escalating for food processors who supply retail markets with some processors operating 24 seven. The main priority for this sector on our food supply sector is to keep their workers healthy and to ensure product safety. Food processors are already subject to very strict sanitation protocols and practices but are also implementing enhanced measures recommended by Alberta Health Services and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency guidelines to ensure staff and products are safe. We are working with the federal government to ensure our processing facilities are moving products into the supply chain safely to ensure food is getting to stores. We know that access to personal protective equipment is essential and we are working with food processors and other levels of government to ensure they have access to a secure supply. Many facilities already had pandemic or emergency response plans in place and are running well. To respond to the increase in retail sales, Alberta's distribution systems have increased its capacity in the overall number and frequencies of deliveries. We are monitoring this capacity to ensure the distribution system is well equipped to keep up with retail demand. 
Railway operations are recovering from the disruption caused by rail blockades and labour disputes which impacted the movement of goods across the country. However, CN has assured us that they have the capacity to address this sudden spike in demand and to alleviate pressures on long-haul truck drivers. The Alberta Motor Transport Association assured us that the supply chain is moving well and the efforts by government to keep trucking lines open are working so far. Canada has garnered exemptions for commercial carriers involved in Canada-US cross-border travel with daily trade access across the Canada-US border totally more than 1.7 billion. In particular, truck drivers and train crews are exempt from the 14-day self-isolation requirements after crossing the US border. The federal and provincial governments are also supporting small to medium-sized businesses to take some of the immediate financial pressures off. And we are working with Alberta's farmers, ranchers and farm groups to ensure there are no additional barriers to primary production throughout this pandemic. Retail demand for food is high, however, all four components of our food supply chain are fully functioning, including producers, processors, food retailers and distributors. And again, I would like to reiterate to Albertans that you do not need to stockpile food and supplies. This practice puts additional pressures on our food system, including food banks, which have seen a substantial rise in requests for support. And they expect this trend to continue. And I want to again reassure Albertans that our food supply will remain safe, secure and accessible. I will close by sharing my sincere gratitude for essential service providers like farmers, ranchers, food processors, truck drivers, delivery people, retailers and their staff, food service professionals and the entire food supply chain. These hardworking people have really stepped up and are working hard to keep themselves, their staff and Albertans safe and healthy and to ensure a secure food supply in our province. And with that, I'll close and turn things over to Deputy Minister Winnick. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Good morning. I'm Paul Winnick, the Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs which is the ministry that oversees emergency management and the Provincial Operations Centre. As you know, the Provincial Operations Centre is responsible for coordinating our overall provincial response to this situation, including managing concerns around food supply. As Minister Dreeshin mentioned, agricultural and forestry is closely monitoring the food supply through its government and many industrial contacts. The Provincial Operations Centre is also actively engaged. The Alberta government is working with federal, territorial and provincial partners to ensure that goods move across the country as smoothly as possible, ensuring that our vital supply lines remain open. At the Provincial Operations Centre, representatives from all provincial ministries, major federal departments and key industries track what is happening across Alberta, as well as in adjacent uh, provinces and territories. The Centre acts as a conduit for information to and from communities throughout our province so that we can be alerted quickly to issues of concern such as any that might arise around food supply and immediately put government resources into action as required. Alberta has been through significant emergencies and disasters in recent years and we have come through all of these by working together. This is no different. We continue to work together to keep Albertans safe and to ensure that they have access to the vital goods and services that they need. Thank you. And be uh, happy to take any questions. So what is new? Like, uh, I'm still trying to understand why we're here. Like, what, what has changed in the way that you're managing or monitoring food supplies? Because you're looking for more information <coughs> about about how things are moving around or you actually, did you actually change any policy? So let's uh, Deputy Minister Winnick uh, add to this, but at the Provincial Operations Centre, the POC, we are communicating more with the entire supply chain. So typically we wouldn't be having daily calls with the entire supply chain to see are there any disruptions because it is so fluid. I, you will have people contact me to say that there are you know, cargo planes not, not being able to make it or that ports uh, are, are loading up of ships and demerge costs are increasing. So we really want to get a, a good handle on the entire supply chain. And so that's why we're, we're doing the extra added efforts 
of going out and talking to the, the entire food supply chain to make sure that they are getting what they they need, and if there is need for government intervention, that we, we have a clear understanding of what that would be. Minister, you mean government intervention, like what kinds of things could you do if you saw if, problematic? I mean, it's a, not to go into hypotheticals, but if the, the border were to close, for example, that there would have to be extra government measures to make sure that we would do everything that we could to not have the border close. And it's so building those types of contingency plans is, is essentially what we're, we're doing this preparatory work beforehand. So if DM, if you'd like to add to that. Thank you, Minister. Yes, just to, uh, to, to further add to Minister Dries Dreesen's response, in terms of what's, what has changed, uh, certainly when shelves were bare last week, um, I assure you that the provincial planners did a lot of planning, a lot of investigation. As Mr. Dreesen as Minister Dreeshen has said, have really looked into the supply chains to confirm that there really aren't any issues. It was essentially a demand issue and not a supply issue. So what's changed is essentially both Minister Dreeshen and myself would like to assure Albertans that there is no supply shortage at this time. It's being monitored very carefully and to once again uh, extol Albertans uh, not to panic buy, simply to carry on with their normal rate of consumption. Minister, you mentioned in your opening remarks that you're looking at uh, helping food banks in the short or medium or long term. What are you looking at doing, and does that include directly getting food to them? Yes, it's something that uh, whether it's a financial uh, assistant to, assistance to food banks to say that we can actually go out and, and help them buy food that they need. Again, uh, stressing the, the importance of donations to food banks for Albertans to, to realize that they are, again, a vulnerable, uh, important piece of, of our society, but also they support vulnerable Albertans so to make sure that they, they get the food that they need. So those are something that we're, in, again, in constant contact with, with food banks to, to see, you know, where is the demand? Is there something, what the capacity that they could actually take um, additional, additional financial resources? And I think I saw in the OICs there's an extra 74 million for ag <clears throat> out of the uh, 74 million for ag out of the uh, emergency fund. And disaster emergency assistance fund. Yes. What and is that for? So w whether it's um, if Paul Winnick, if you want, or Deputy Minister Winnick, you want to address that specifically. Yeah, so I, I think you're aware of the Disaster Contingency Fund. It, uh, there has been uh, $750 million that has been budgeted. Some of that money will obviously be devoted over time to, to deal with this crisis as we go forward. But we've got $74 million now, so what do you need it for? We'll, we'll get back to you on the specifics of that. No, but why did you ask for it then? You must, there must be some idea of why. Is this just we'll, we'll, to have it in, in hand, or is there a specific? The contingency fund itself is, is there, so it is something you could always draw from. So we'll, we'll follow up specifically with you. I'm just wondering you. why are you drawing from Why are you drawing $74 million from it? Can you give us any even a broad understanding of why you need it? Well, like I said, we'll, we'll follow up with you on that. It says for support. For funding income support and insurance for disaster emergency assistance for the 2019 agricultural economic hardship disaster. So, can you expand on that? We'll 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 get you additional information on that. If that's okay. Can I ask an anecdotal question? We're hearing that in some supermarkets that there's it's there's sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to what's not there. Like one day there's no onions there, another day another store doesn't have any chicken. Is that just? hiccups in the chain or is are people hoarding specific things or it's it's usually what well, we have seen when it comes to to meat that it's it's been a high demand or things like craft dinner or long shelf life products but what typically happens is you'll have individuals that'll go and fill up their entire cart with a certain product and then it's really just up to the the grocer to make sure that they're restocking as fast as they can because even that that image of seeing an empty shelf is something that there's not a, as as deputy minister mentioned, it's not a supply issue. It's just a, an overbuying or a, a panic on the demand side. So that's it's those would be the two items that we've we've seen or heard of that uh, that when it comes to meat or long shelf lives that they've been in higher demand uh, as of late. So that will go to the back of the room. Yeah, can you speak just a little bit to how, what the difference would be in income support in in your ministry versus? the emergency isolation support that we saw roll out yesterday. Is there a difference in how that would be delivered? 
Again, I could would hand things over to, to Deputy Minister Winnick, but when it comes to, to the income income supports, it's whether it's a, a farmer or a self-employed farmer or just a, a regular or uh, non-agriculture employee, the, the program we want to make sure that there is some type of equity or equitable support for them. So, uh, but I'll, I'll hand things over to you. Yeah, I don't think I have anything I could add to that at this point, Minister. Okay. Did you have a follow-up? And well, this is unrelated, but is there? I mean, how much of the food supply relies on international trade? Uh, for example, at the, at the U.S. border, and how much you know comes from within the province? Can you speak to that? So, a tremendous amount uh, relies on international trade. Uh, and it's it's obvious going to a grocery store, you'll see oranges from from Florida or avocados from Mexico. There is there is a tremendous amount of international trade that goes into our our regular current food supply system. So that is, that's why it's critically important to make sure that the border remains open between Canada and the U.S. And that's why the, the truck driver provisions uh, that they don't have to self-isolate because they're, they're doing daily runs. If they had to wait two weeks every time they cross the border to self-isolate, it would, it would essentially, even though the border would be open, it would essentially crush a lot of our, our supply chain. So that is something that we want to make sure that, that remains open. The provisions to make sure that uh, the self-isolating provisions for truck drivers was that they are exempted from it is, is an important uh, important policy decision that is allowing our, our supply chain to remain open. So with that, we're going to go to the lines. Operator, can you put the first call through, please? Our first question comes from Jeremy Sims of the Western Producer. Your line is open. Hi, Minister. Just asking about declaring agriculture food supply as an essential service. What kind of implications does that mean for those people in the industry? Are they would be required to work constantly, or can you just elaborate on those implications? Well, a, an essential service ultimately just goes to show the importance of, of that industry, so that if they were to be shut down, that it would have broader economic effects that would, that would ripple through, through society. So that's obviously food being, the, being so essential that we all need to eat is something that, you know, other... Other types of industry, like our you know water supply systems or, or other critical infrastructure, we want to make sure that will always be maintained. So declaring agriculture as an essential service, I think, just amplifies the need of of its importance. But again, it's it's not a uh, indentured servitude where they are going to have to uh, work around the clock. It is something that they obviously are when it comes to food processing. Uh, facilities that they are working 24-7. They are adding extra shifts. So it is something that they want to be able to wrap, ramp up demand of if they need to, that they can be able to, to hire people. But that's, that's a side issue to just declaring agriculture as, as an essential service. Okay. And I just have a follow-up question, if that's all right. Um, so just some farmers are saying, you know, supplies, they can get them now and things are okay. But there are some concerns about getting key supplies in the future as we head into seeding in spring. Um, so, you know, if that situation worsens, do you see any role the provincial government will have to play to intervene to ensure this supply chain stays intact? Well, and, and to that point, when it comes to, to parts, uh, again, if it's if that distribution network is important and required to keep an essential service like agriculture operating, that is something that we, we would obviously make sure that that supply chain continues as well. Because as, as you point out, whether it's, it's vaccine for, for cattle or, or machinery parts for, for farmers when they go into seeding, we want to make sure that those parts are being, are being distributed and, and can be uh, shipped across North America as, as they typically would. Great, thank you. Operator, can you please put in the next caller? Our next question comes from Rod Nickel of Reuters. Your line is open. Yeah, hi, Minister. I just want to follow up on Jeremy's um, first question there because I'm, I'm still not clear in, in the practical world what, what it means that you're declaring the food supply system as an essential service. Can you give us one sort of practical example of what changes with this declaration? So ultimately, if, if any industry... In, in the event of you know, further government action to say that there are more businesses that would have to be closed or non-essential, essentially, businesses would be closed, that essential services, once you've identified them, they would not be affected. So they're not allowed to close, essentially? That they, that they yes. So essentially, we're making, we're adding the, the list of what is essential, 
And so that no matter what were to happen in the future, if there was to be further government actions, that that essential service of agriculture, of our food network, food supply chain would, uh, would remain open. Great, thank you operator. Can you please put on the next caller? Operator, can you please put through City News? Our, yeah, our question comes from Sarlata. Your line is open. Uh, that's Sharolta. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, so what are we going to do if chaos breaks out in the United States as they do have different COVID rules in place in Canada? What if we aren't able to get food from our main supplier? So that's something that, uh, again, we're, we're trying to avoid that, but we are doing... Uh, emergency plans in the event that that were to be the case, that if you had to outsource from, from different areas or where could we actually be able to, where could industry be able to, to draw certain types of, uh, of food, food products to, to Alberta. So it's, uh, you know, when it comes to emergency preparedness and, and the what coulds, uh, it, it is difficult to try to plan for, for any event, but uh, we, are, we are developing that to see, you know, what are the highest likely affected um, you know, U.S. industries that could be affected by this uh, that are interwoven into our, our supply chain network. So as of right now, there's no kind of plan in place if we can't get stuff from, from the state. Because like I know we're talking about, you know, truckers and stuff being able to come in across the border and keeping grocery stores open, but what if they're not even able to bring us anything? So, and, and I mean, the contingency plan to say, well, if, if the border is closed, well, then we would look at the, the West Coast and the East Coast to say that where could we try to make sure that we could have more containers of, of that product coming into to the country and eventually coming to distribution centers here in the province. So, again, it's, it, it, you know, dealing with every type of hypothetical and preparing for it, we are looking at the highest risk right now. And I think that's the, the fairest you could, you could characterize, just the, the planning for any type of, of future event, not for the low-risk ones, but the potential higher-risk uh, scenarios. Operator, can you please put on the next caller? Our next question comes from Catherine Krakowski of Alberta Today. Your line is open. Afternoon, Minister. Um, what have you heard from your uh, federal counterparts about the seasonal agricultural worker program? Like how, does, how does the closure of borders impact uh, that program? So we have heard from the federal government that the temporary foreign worker program will continue. There's about 60,000 uh, workers that come in. About a third of that come or go to the province of Ontario, and they're the biggest uh, partner, the biggest user of the program. But uh, it, it is, they are, they are allowing them to come in. So whichever country the temporary foreign workers are coming from, mostly it's, it's Mexico and, and Central America, that they are, are still allowed to come in, obviously having to go through um, uh, safety protocols that, uh, that a Canadian would have to. But it is something that we, in addition to that, we as a province are looking at a, a job matching program internally here in the province of Alberta with unemployment rates um, being quite, being, being high and with uh, modeling showing that it could be even higher. We want to make sure that we could match skills that Albertans have here at two, two job opportunities here in the province. So that's something that we're, we're currently under, it's currently under development, but uh, on the, when it comes to TFWs, they, uh, they will, they will come into Canada. Operator, can you please put on the next caller? Our next question comes from Alexis of Alberta Farmer. Your line is open. Hi there, Minister. Um, I have heard rumors that there would be a potential, I want to know if these are just rumors, if there could be potential closure between provincial borders, and if so, <clears throat> how would we deal with that? The, right now, those those just be rumors. Um, again, when it comes to contingency plans, um, that uh, that's you know stuff we would always look at, but obviously we want to make sure that the free flow of goods and people across Canada continues. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and with that we will wrap up for today. Um, we do we do have to get going, so no further questions at this time. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.